Have you ever wondered why China's quiet but uh, really massive push for a fully indigenous computing and communication infrastructure could fundamentally change the way we look at global commerce and maybe more importantly, national security? Well, it's not really a could anymore, is it? It's yeah. happening right now. We're actually seeing what looks like a monumental failure of the old global containment strategy. The one that assumed Western tech was just unassailable. Exactly that one. Uh. And instead, these recent product releases, you know, these indigenous desktops, that revolutionary satellite phone feature, they signal the birth of something else, mm. a parallel, truly independent digital ecosystem. Right. And for years, the thinking was that U.S. sanctions, export controls, especially on ship making tools, that they'd cripple companies like Huawei. That was the assumption, yeah. So our mission here is to really examine the specific hardware, the software mandates behind it, and these, frankly, radical tech leaps that show that assumption was, well, fundamentally flawed. It seems China didn't just survive the blockade. They actually used that pressure, didn't they, to achieve this technological sovereignty. It's a fascinating case of forced self-sufficiency. It really is. Let's maybe start with what some are calling the desktop shock. This happened back in November 2025. The quiet release of the Qingyin W515Y and W585Y desktop computers. Okay, I remember seeing bits about that, but it barely made a ripple in Western news. Exactly. But these aren't prototypes. They're production-ready machines rolling out right now to government agencies, big state-owned enterprises across China. So it's like a functional declaration of independence, technologically speaking. Pretty much. And the key part isn't the plastic case, obviously. It's what's inside. They're powered by Huawei's own Kirin 9000X processor. Kirin 9000X? What are the specs like? It's an 8-core, 12-thread chip running at about 2.5 gigahertz. Now look, these specs might not blow away the absolute latest high-end gaming chip from Intel or AMD. Right. But that's not really the point, is it? That comparison misses the mark. So what makes this chip so significant then? If it's not just raw speed, what's revolutionary? The revolution is its independence. That's the thing. This chip was produced entirely within China, without relying on the foreign fabrication tech or the design tools that Washington controls. Oh, okay. And for what it needs to do running government databases, secure comms, basic office stuff, it's more than powerful enough, plus it gives them full security oversight. And crucially, it runs on operating systems that are also completely China-developed. Right, either Tongzhen US V20 or the Galaxy Kirin Kos V10. You know, for decades, the West held enormous influence, partly because what? Something like 70% of the world's desktops run on Microsoft Windows. That dependency was a vulnerability for Beijing, you mean? Exactly. Now, what's interesting here is that UOS and Kos, they're actually based on Linux but they've been heavily customized, hardened, certified, specifically for government use. So they're trading that sort of universal Windows compatibility. For a system they can audit and control right down to the kernel level. Yeah. Security over convenience, essentially. Which really underscores the, uh, the failure of the sanctions, doesn't it? The whole point was to stop China from making functional modern computing systems. And the unintended result. It seems to be the creation of this nearly fully indigenous ecosystem demonstrably requires zero American components. I saw a figure on the previous model, the L420X. The localization rate was something astonishing. It was. 98.4%. That's the figure. 98.4%. That that number is the real story here, isn't it? It absolutely is. It means pretty much everything, CPU, integrated graphics, Wi-Fi modules, memory controllers designed or made within China. That's a massive and, frankly, often overlooked industrial achievement. And you can even tell who the customer is just by looking at the design choices, right? They're not really aiming for you and me, the average consumer. Not at all. It's clearly aimed at massive institutional buyers, government, large enterprises. That detail about the ports was quite revealing, I thought. You've got modern HDMI, sure, but right next to it, a VGA port. Yeah, VGA. Technology most consumer PCs dropped years ago. Why include that? It's a nod to the messy reality of big institutions. You know, government offices, big companies, they still have tons of older monitors, projectors, security systems that rely on VGA. Ah, okay. Yeah. So by including it, Huawei is basically saying, look, we get it. We support your existing complex setup while giving you a modern, secure, totally domestic platform. But there has to be a trade-off, right? Does this intense focus on localization, on domestic standards? Yeah. Does it hurt performance significantly or compatibility with the wider internet? That's the immediate question a Western user would ask. And that is the core trade-off. Yeah. Absolutely. 
they are prioritizing sovereignty and security over maybe having the absolute bleeding edge speed or perfect compatibility with every single Western software package. Because dependency equals vulnerability. Precisely. And when Washington clearly uses technology access as a major tool of statecraft, well, running your critical national infrastructure on American-controlled platforms becomes just too risky for Beijing. And this huge shift, it's not happening by accident. It's driven by a pretty big government mandate. A massive one, yes. Okay, let's unpack that. We're talking about the Xinhuang program, right? Or Xinhuang. Yes, Xinhuang Xinhuang. It's the official strategic initiative. And it mandates, it requires all critical government and enterprise IT infrastructure to transition to domestic hardware and software. And there's a deadline? There is. 2027, it's not a suggestion, it's a hard deadline. Wow. And the market impact of that mandate, it's been immediate and pretty brutal for some big Western tech players. Devastating is probably the right word. Beijing is effectively slamming the door shut on foreign processors and government systems. Which directly hits companies like Intel. Huge impact on Intel. Historically, they got something like, what, 27% of their global revenue directly from China, billions in steady income. That stream is drying up fast. And AMD too, presumably. Them too. They're losing these massive revenue streams that they rely on you know, to fund their future R&D. Right, when they need it most, with competition heating up in areas like AI. Exactly. It creates this kind of dangerous feedback loop for them, while simultaneously fueling domestic investment inside China. Now, what's really fascinating, technically speaking, is how Chinese companies managed this production capacity when they were cut off from ASML. You know, the Dutch company with these super advanced EUV machines for chip making. That was supposed to be the ultimate choke point, wasn't it? Everyone thought so. Yet Chinese firms particularly Semic Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, they somehow developed methods to get to 7 nanometer equivalent tech using older DUV deep ultraviolet machines. Which was thought impossible, uh -huh. or at least prohibitively expensive. Pretty much, yeah. It was previously thought you just couldn't get there efficiently with DUV. So how did they pull that off? How did they bypass needing those specialized ASML machines? Well, it seems like sheer scientific determination, frankly. An incredible investment in something called multi-patterning techniques. Multi-patterning. Yeah. Basically, they developed these extremely complex, very time-consuming ways of running the silicone wafers through the older DUV machines multiple times, layering patterns with incredible precision to get the density you'd normally achieve with a single EUV pass. Wow. So a technological workaround born entirely out of necessity. Driven entirely by the need for independence, yes. So what this really means then is that the world is, right now, actively splitting into two distinct tech ecosystems. It certainly looks that way. You've got the American-led system, Windows, Intel, NVIDIA standards on one side, and then this emerging Chinese alternative, Huawei, Tongzhen UOS, Sesmic for chips. It's not just a market adjustment. This feels like a profound systemic realignment. We're seeing the birth of a genuinely bipolar technological world. And for those Western multinationals. It gets complicated. Maintaining separate product lines, compliant supply chains for two non-interoperable markets. Mm -hmm. That's going to drastically increase costs, fragment R&D budgets, potentially slow down global innovation overall. And while we're talking about the split, we can't ignore China's own leverage point, can we? The rare earth. Oh, yes, the strategic counter leverage. That's Beijing's ace in the hole, physically speaking. Mm -hmm. They control something like 85% of the global processing capacity for these critical minerals. Materials essential for everything digital, basically. Everything. Advanced chips, smartphones, EV batteries, even specialized defense systems. If Beijing decides to restrict exports, they can put immense pressure on the very Western manufacturers they're now cutting off from their domestic market. It's a powerful card to hold. Okay, but here's where, for me, it gets really interesting. Moving from computing to communications. November 2024, Huawei unveils the Mate 70 smartphone. Astonishing, yes. Yeah. A regular smartphone that can message satellites directly from your pocket. No special antenna, no bulky add-on. No special equipment needed at all, just the phone itself. This is a genuine leapfrog moment. How did they manage that? Well, they achieved it by using China's Tannen Satellite Network. It's a major wow. constellation, mixes LEO and MEO satellites. Originally built mostly for military and government use. But now opened up for civilian applications. Exactly. They're leveraging that existing infrastructure. But the tech inside the phone must be incredible. Miniaturizing all that? Absolutely. Huawei engineers had to develop, reportedly, a revolutionary, super-efficient power amplifier chip. 
and a completely new, very sophisticated antenna system. Think about it. It has to track satellites whipping across the sky at 27,000 kilometers per hour. That's mind-boggling. And the performance. Is it usable? Reports say it's robust. An ultra-low delay, just 0.7 seconds for messaging. Now, think about the practical implications. It changes everything for remote areas, right? Fundamentally. Vast areas of rural Africa, huge stretches of the ocean for shipping, remote places like Alaska, yeah. areas where it's just too expensive to lay fiber or put up cell towers. This tech makes traditional infrastructure potentially obsolete there. But we've already seen it used in real-world situations. We have. Disaster response, for example. Rescue teams used it successfully during earthquake relief in Sichuan when all the ground networks were down. Wow. And you hear reports from maritime shipping companies' crews staying in constant secure contact right across the Pacific, the Atlantic. It's a game changer for them. And strategically, this links into their own navigation system too. It integrates directly with Beidou, China's own satellite navigation system. Beidou uses, I think, 45 satellites now. It provides positioning, navigation, timing services completely separate from GPS. Creating a closed loop. Exactly. Communication, mm. navigation, timing, all operating entirely outside of Western control. That offers unparalleled security and resilience for its users. And that independence must be appealing geopolitically. Hugely appealing. We're seeing developing nations, Kenya, Indonesia, Pakistan, Brazil, are examples paying very close attention. Why make the switch? Well. China often offers comparable tech performance, but at lower prices, sometimes with attractive financing deals attached. But maybe more importantly, these nations gain technological sovereignty. They get the tech without the political strings that sometimes come with Western partnerships. Okay, so let's try and synthesize this. We've got the indigenous computing stack, the satellite communication leap. What are the main takeaways here? I think there are two undeniable ones. First, Technological sovereignty for China isn't theoretical anymore. It's a functional, demonstrable reality. Mm -hmm. They can build and run their own digital world. And second. Second, China hasn't just caught up in some areas. They've actually leapfrogged Western capabilities in critical infrastructure, like this direct-to-satellite communication. It shatters that long-held belief in perpetual Western tech superiority. So the old era the unified global digital infrastructure, pretty much based on U.S. standards, that's definitively over. It's over. That unified structure is actively splintering. We're heading towards two poles, two ecosystems that are fundamentally non-interoperable. Which raises a really important question, maybe the most important one for you, the listener, to consider. As both sides race now to secure their own independent supply chains, to set their own distinct standards, you know, Windows Intel versus Huawei UOS, GPS versus Beidoutenong, what are the long-term, the irreversible implications for global commerce, for the flow of data, for innovation itself, when the world has to operate on two completely parallel digital realities? 